live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Will there be a border breakthrough or more of the same? More than 60 House Republicans, including the Speaker of the House, are set to visit Eagle Pass. The Speaker says he wants to see the impact of the border crisis for himself. Our Daniela Ibarra is live from the border tonight. So, Daniela, how are people who live there, who work there, feeling about this upcoming visit? Well, Myron, Steve, I got to tell you, we talked to a lot of people today. A lot of them didn't even know that this visit was happening. Some of them were surprised. Others say they're glad and others say that they're frustrated. It's taken this long for people from the federal government to come. One person even told me he wishes that this visit would have happened two weeks ago when this field behind me was packed with migrants. We were here when that happened. At some points, there were over 2,400 migrants waiting in that field overnight to be processed. Now, we also spoke with business owners who also say that they're frustrated with this crisis. Now, some of these businesses we spoke with, they say that most recent surge has cost them money. With Border Patrol diverting their resources to process migrants, it's taking longer for people to cross over onto the bridge onto this side of the border. We spoke with one business owner who says it took hours for employees and customers to cross. Because of that delay, the president of Eagle Pass's Chamber of Commerce says he's heard some businesses have taken a profit loss of anywhere between 40 to 60 percent. Now, the people who live here, they want solutions and they're hoping tomorrow's visit will provide them with some. Daniela, let's talk about solutions. Congressman Tony Gonzalez says he wants the same thing. He wants people in Congress to solve the immigration issues. There's going to be a lot of congressmen there tomorrow. Is this different than so many visits we've seen before? Is there hope that some sort of bipartisan solution can be reached? Or is this just another photo op that both parties seem to do at the border these days? Well, that's, a lot of, that's what a lot of people here in Eagle Pass want to know for themselves. I do want to point out that that group of delegates who's coming, they're all Republicans. Tony Gonzalez, when he was here a couple weeks ago, he did say that he wanted to work with both sides of the aisle. He actually sent a letter to congressional leaders, both Democrats and Republicans, asking for them to step up and help. So those delegates, they're the ones who are coming. Let's talk about the people who are there now, though. You mentioned those fields we saw that were packed behind you a couple of weeks ago. What are you seeing right now in terms of any migrants gathered there? Are there people still waiting to be processed? Meyer, from where we're standing right now, we haven't really seen anyone. Like, this has been it. Nobody's standing behind us. We have seen a couple of buses pull up. From what we've been able to tell, they're empty. We do see Border Patrol here, not as many of, as we've seen in the past, but we haven't really seen any migrants come over. All right, so we know the Speaker of the House, Johnson's going to be there tomorrow. Is Eagle Pass expecting any more federal visits in the days to come? Yeah, actually a week from today, they're expecting the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, to come. He's expected to meet with Border Patrol and local leaders. And that's someone, Steve, who, when we've talked to people who live here in Eagle Pass on our visits here before, that's someone who, by name, they've wanted to come here to Eagle Pass. All right, Daniela, thank you so much. Live in Eagle Pass, we'll see what this visit from these delegates actually brings. Thanks so much. Meantime, in Washington tonight, the Biden administration is now asking the U.S. Supreme Court to let U.S. Border Patrol cut razor wire at the southern border. Last year, Texas sued to halt the wire removal, claiming that it's a destruction of state property. State officials also explain that it's effective in keeping migrants from entering the U.S. A federal appeals court recently ordered Border Patrol officials to stop cutting the wire pending court proceedings. That led to the Justice Department filing an emergency application calling for the high court to overturn that decision. Back here closer to home, let's take a look outside with live cam. It has been a dreary, chilly day out there, Sarah Spivey, but good to see the rain. Absolutely good to see the rain, not only because we're in drought, but keep in mind that Mount Cedar just a few days ago was very, very high. So this rain is going to help to wash out at least some of the mountain cedar in the air. Cedar season still lasts until about mid-February. So we've got a ways to go, but again, some good rain. Came at a time, though, when a lot of people are trying to get home. So not great news there. Hey, but good news for those southeast of San Antonio, Floresville, up toward Gonzales, and even Seguin. It's been a fairly dry day, but you're starting to see rain really work its way in, and that'll be the case for the remainder of the night. Back here in San Antonio, there's a few storms uh, that are moving through I-10 right now. More bark than bite, flashes of lightning, perhaps even some pea-sized hail, but nothing major. The high temperature today was only 48 degrees because of the rain. Coming up in the forecast, we're going to talk about rain possible again Thursday night. Chilly
mostly through Friday morning. And the next big thing, very gusty winds early next week. Those details coming up. Thank you, Sarah. Let's check out Transguide right now. Let's go to 410 at Bandera, where I believe there's some sort of an accident. Looks like on the access road there. You can see a number of emergency vehicles, and actually they're trying to get people to go off on the access road there. It looks like they've closed down the entire thing. Again, this is Loop 410 at Bandera, a traffic trouble spot not on 410 itself, but it looks like that's the access road just off 410 at Bandera. We've had some challenges, uh, but I, I believe uh, by and large we've we've had a successful year. That is how Bear County Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez sees 2023. Last year, his office dealt with a wave of attorneys leaving attacks from the San Antonio Police Officers Association, and we saw several surprising case dismissals and plea deals. After repeated requests, Eric Hernandez finally sat down with the DA to get his take on the first year of his second term. So help me God. What looked like a promising start to a second term quickly took a turn for District Attorney Joe Gonzalez and his office. There was an influx of employees leaving, victims' families unhappy with how their cases were resolved. The chief of police in the San Antonio Police Union's Association criticized the handling of habitual offenders, a backlog of unindicted cases, and an increase in dismissed cases. Time and time again, Gonzalez wasn't available for an interview. But during an availability to talk about property crimes, we switched the subject to ask overall how 2023 was for his office. We've uh, we've had the highest murder conviction rate that we've had in the last 12 years. We have a, a over 90 percent conviction rate on our felony DWIs. Uh, we continue to work hard. As far as dismissals and plea deals, Gonzalez says those are tough decisions, but necessary ones. If we roll the dice and lose and that person is acquitted, he walks out the door. So oftentimes, uh, accepting a plea deal of 25 or 30 years on something that, that um, may end up with, a, with an acquittal uh, is not the optimum outcome, but it's the best that, that we can get for, uh, for that particular case. 25 years, 30 years, is that enough for a person's life? I always put myself in the situation, how would I feel if that was me, if that was my daughter that was a victim of a murder, if that was my wife that had been assaulted. Uh, so yes, it is, it is very, uh, a very tough thing to do, but unfortunately that, that comes with the territory. That's, that's part of, uh, of my job. Gonzalez did say his office was trying to do a better job to communicate with victims' families. We're trying to, to be as uh, um, transparent as possible, to be as receptive uh, to anybody that, that has any questions about uh, the status of their case. As for what's ahead in 2024? We hope uh, what, what is ahead is that we further reduce the crime that we see in, in Bear County. Uh, and in San Antonio, uh, we hope for uh, greater collaboration with law enforcement. Uh, we hope with, uh, that we can work better with our uh, law enforcement partners and with our uh, court partners uh, in order uh, to do our, our job more effectively. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A 37-year-old man has been arrested for allegedly shooting his girlfriend's renter in an argument outside a Beacon Hill home last month. Police say Sean Pavanka, this man dating 41-year-old David Beck's landlord who was trying to evict him. However, police say Beck had won an appeal that he planned to show the landlord that day. Court records confirm Beck was part of two ongoing cases surrounding an eviction. Police say Pavanka got in the mix as well as his girlfriend and swung his fist at Beck, narrowly missing his face. Both men pulled out guns. However, an SAPD spokesman described Beck as doing it in a defensive manner, while Pavanka did it in an offensive manner. After shooting Beck, who's pictured there, Pavanka stayed at the scene. He was not immediately arrested, but police eventually found enough evidence, including cell phone video, to rule out self-defense. Beck's widow says he was a bartender downtown. He had a four-year-old daughter, and the couple have another child on the way. New records show an SAPD officer was driving 100 miles an hour before crashing into another officer. She's now been suspended 45 days. That crash happened in late June on West Avenue and Bassey Road. Records obtained by KSAT Investigates show Officer Bianca Garcia and another officer were responding to a call at the time. Garcia accidentally pitted the other officer's vehicle, causing it to crash into a utility pole. Onboard computer software showed Garcia was driving 100 miles an hour on a section of road where the speed limit is 35. 
SAPD previously told us both Garcia and the other officer were hospitalized. Garcia was cited for violating SAPD rules on safe vehicle operation. Records show she was suspended three days for a separate crash back in June of 2022. Now to a critical shortage. Shortages of ADHD medication have been growing progressively worse for the last couple of years. Now some families find themselves in panic mode trying to fill those medications that aren't readily available. Courtney Friedman spoke to a local mom with ADHD whose kids also have different forms of this disorder. She shows us the reality of what all this means for them. And I will show you that that one is empty. Brett Gertensen shows us her 12 year old daughter's ADHD medication that's vital for her to function mentally, physically and emotionally. There are a couple different types and her shows up in a bit of an aggressive way. Brett and her other two children also have ADHD, all in different forms. They were all on the same medication in a drug class separate from Adderall. Adderall is what became scarce over the past two to three years. Partly as a result of manufacturer delays, partly as a result of quota allotments. Dr. Giancarlo Ferrucci is a psychiatrist with UT Health San Antonio and University Health. He's cared for the Gertensen family for 10 years now. He says last year when the Adderall shortage got worse, patients turned to the medication the Gertensons were taking, causing a shortage there too. I'm calling the pharmacies. I'm like, okay, they have it. Or like they have 15 days. Can we just get 15 days? Can you call and approve that? The brand name pills would have cost them $700 a month. So they switched medications, but they're still struggling to get them regularly filled. After this interview today, Brett headed straight to fill her daughter's medication just in time. So you're literally changing your whole day around just to fit the fact that this is empty. Well, we are taking her off her schedule, which is uh, a little dicey in general. <laughs> Dr. Feruzzi wants patients to know while it can be tough to change medications, there is a list of safe and effective alternatives. Something to consider since he says it could be well into the mid or third quarter of 2024 before it gets back to normal. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Still ahead here on the news at six, following our Know My Neighborhood series on Alamo Ranch, the Bear County Sheriff's Office decided to make changes on how they patrol that neighborhood. A look at the new BCSO initiative, it's starting in 2024. Next. More than a week ago, a clear alert was sent out to Texans asking them to be on the lookout for a pregnant Savannah Soto and her boyfriend Matthew Guerra. Now we're trying to find out more about the clear alert system and what it takes for an alert to be sent out in the first place. That's tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Back in November in our Know My Neighborhood series, we focused on Alamo Ranch and the issues that families in that area face. And one of the problems they deal with we heard about several times was related to law enforcement. Yeah, now the Bear County Sheriff's Office is making changes. And as Max Massey shows us as part of new initiatives in 2024, Alamo Ranch families will see an increased BCSO presence. Uh, in 2024, we're going to be adding additional uh, districts. Additional districts means means an increased response time, more deputies in the area. Deputy Adam Turbyville has been patrolling Alamo Ranch for more than 10 years. Uh, when I started patrolling out here, it was very uh, secluded, very wooded, a lot of uh, cow pastures, <laughs> a lot of farmland. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, uh, fortunately, it's now as, uh, houses as far as the eye can see. Deputy Turbyville tells me BCSO saw the Know My Neighborhood special and they're responding accordingly. You know, we try our best to keep up with the uh, demand and request for the community uh, on a regular basis. There are changes on the way, but still constant calls for service during the day. We do in the Alamo Ranch area get a uh, lot of requests for traffic enforcement due to the speeding and the racing. And then at night, we're looking more for car burglaries, right? Suspicious vehicles, suspicious persons. And these issues, they are not going away on their own. From the months of the end of September to the beginning of December, we had 77 calls for burglaries, right? But that includes burglary of vehicles, uh, burglary of residents, burglary of buildings, anything that has a title burglary attached. We even had one uh, bur burglary of a coin operated machine. And yes, even though families here in Alamo Ranch, they're going to see more BCSO deputies on the roads. Well, one of the concentrations, it's actually off the streets for 2024 and it's on your phone.
it's a digital age, right? It comes with a territory. So now phone numbers can be spoofed, right? We get uh, phone numbers that say San Antonio, Texas, and I answer it. And it's, you know, a, a scammer or telemarketer from overseas, right? With the increase in our technology, we're seeing a huge increase in the varieties and ways that different scams are being perpetrated. Sheriff Javier Salazar tells us senior fraud and scams, there's something that BCSO sees more and more prevalent. And there are new efforts to combat that. But in 2024, BCSO, they're going to have 50 more deputy positions added, and that can go a long way across the community. We're going to get an increase of deputies on the streets. In addition to that, we're going to get an increase of investigators, right? As the population increases, we need an uh, uh, increase in our patrolmen. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. We'll remember that. So. All right, let's talk about this rain. We saw a good soaking in some parts of our area today, although it was... It was quite the combo with it being a little chilly out so there. It's a yeah. little chilly, a little yeah. messy, but you know what? Beneficial rain, yeah. no major problems, I'll take it. Yeah, exactly. The only issue is that it happened close to the evening commute, so there were sure. some traffic issues out there, and there still are. Uh, but again, these these showers and storms are not severe. We're seeing a few flashes of lightning, though, as some of the rain is finally starting to fill in for areas like Pleasanton, Floresville, and out to Gonzales. It's been a relatively dry day there southeast of San Antonio. But as you can see, some decent rain falling on the west side of Bear County uh, between Leon Valley and all the way up to Holotus. We're also seeing some healthier rain right along this uh, area from uh, the Hollywood Park area up through Bulverde up to Canyon. Lake. In fact, I want to focus on this one storm that's moving through uh, areas just south of Camp Bullis right now. There could even be some very, very small, non-damaging pea-sized hail. There are a few flashes of lightning. In fact, we can turn on the lightning counter. In this frame, there's 11 strikes, lightning strikes. So not a, a lot of lightning, but definitely at least some rumbles of thunder out there right now. And the rain is falling hard uh, between 1604, 281, and I-10 right there near Camp Bullis and also seeing a decent thunder shower working its way through areas like Smithson Valley, Startsville, Canyon Lake, up toward Green as well. These are generally moving northeast at about 30 miles per hour. As far as rainfall goes, what I'll do here is I want to show you where the heaviest of the rain has fallen today. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the 24 hour rainfall amount. You can see that there's clearly been those that have seen a lot more rain than others, mainly on the northwest side of Bear County up toward Bernie and out into parts of Medina County as well as in Comal County. Anywhere you see this green, that's where perhaps up to about an inch of rain has fallen. You can see particularly right out where I-10 and 1604 meet, about an inch of rainfall there. Uh, we've seen about a uh, half an inch of rain in the middle of uh, Comal County, but there have been plenty of areas that unfortunately have just not seen all that much rain, mainly southeast of San Antonio toward Elmendorf. It's been fairly dry, not all that much out there, but things are starting to fill in a little bit and we will continue to see some rain until about 9, 10 o'clock tonight. Here's a look at the broader system. You can see that really heavier rain is falling along I-35 toward Dallas. This is the low pressure system. It's on its way east. It's on its way out. In its wake, there's another system that will bring us a rain chance, mainly on Thursday night and Friday morning. Less coverage than what we're seeing out there right now, though. So about 40% coverage Thursday night to Friday. Taking you through the future cast, areas that have missed out on the rain east of San Antonio, likely going to see that later on tonight as the rain comes to an end in San Antonio. By tomorrow morning, we'll have some areas of fog and it'll be a relatively cool day tomorrow with a high right near 56 degrees. Taking you through that KSAT 12 hour forecast, 45 degrees in the morning with patchy fog. By noon, we'll be at 52 and mostly cloudy, 56 for the high temperature tomorrow. So just to recap those weather headlines, rain is ending tonight, possible again Thursday night. Temperatures will be chilly through Friday morning, but we will have a weekend warm up. And then the next big thing is very gusty winds early next week. I want to put this on your radar early. Take a look at wind gusts, possible up to 45 miles per hour on Tuesday of next week. So plan accordingly. Maybe it's a good idea to put up those Christmas inflatables this weekend when the weather is nice so you're not fishing for them later. Mm -hmm. ah. There you go. Thanks, Sarah. All right. So believe it or not, the Dallas Cowboys have something to play for in the final weekend of the regular season, Mary. If you told me that a couple of weeks ago, I probably wouldn't have believed no. you because the Eagles had two games against the Giants and the Cardinals. They seemed like pretty winnable games to me, but that's not what happened. And now 
the Cowboys can possibly get home field advantage. They currently sit atop the NFC East. And that's good because the Cowboys just finished their home record 8-0. So home field advantage would be huge. And what a night we just had of college football playoff game. Steve Garth Sarkeesian and his Texas Longhorns failed to advance, saying penalties were the ultimate killer. Coming up after the break. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. Just about everything went right for the Cowboys in week 17 and now entering their final regular season game of the season on the road against the Commanders. The Cowboys can clinch the NFC East with a win. Dallas currently holds the two seed in the NFC and the Philadelphia Eagles fell to the fifth seed after losing to the at the time three and 12 Arizona Cardinals. Just a couple of weeks ago, the division was the Eagles to lose, but after Dallas's emotional win over Detroit, head coach Mike McCarthy knew exactly what would be on the table. Yes, I mean, I, it's not, nothing surprises me. You know, I'm, um, I, was, I, was, I was there rooting for the Cardinals all the way, my wife and I, in the fourth quarter. But no, I, 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 you see it, you see it all the time. I mean, it's just a, such a competitive league. The NFC East crown will be settled this Sunday at 325 when the Cowboys kick off at FedEx Field, the home of the Commanders. New Year's Day saw two incredibly dramatic college football playoff games that went down to the wire. In last night's Sugar Bowl, down six, the Texas Longhorns drove the length of the field in the final minute, fueled by that clutch 41-yard strike to Jordan Winnington, which helped set up Quinn Ewers with four tries at the end zone to walk it off. But Texas couldn't convert, and the Longhorns fell 37-31 to to the Huskies, ending their final season in the Big 12, 12-2 12 overall. The Longhorns got in their own way a lot of the game, penalized 10 times for 66 yards and two turnovers. For whatever reason, we had some uncharacteristic kind of anxiousness at the line of scrimmage. And I don't know if that's because of the layoff, layoff or just, you know, sometimes being in, in the environment and you're a little excited to go play. Um, but, but I thought we rebounded from those things and, and, you know, we ran the ball really well early in the game. Uh, but like I said, when you, when you fall behind, uh, it, it kind of stressed us where we had to kind of not, not lean on the run like we wanted to. And um, I thought that really changed as much of the game as anything to where, you know, we, we really couldn't lean into the run and, and then, you know, complement it with the passing game. We had to really start throwing it and then mix runs when we could. All right, it'll be two undefeated teams in next Monday's national championship game, Washington against Michigan. I'm trying to be a leader for this team, uh, both on and off the court. Uh, when my name's called, when my number's called, just be ready. Um, you know, my main goal is always just to try to win, try to help the team win as much as I can. So no matter what role I'm in uh, in the team, um, I just got to try to continue to do that. That was fourth year guard Trey Jones on how he's approached his role off of the bench while the Spurs evaluate different players at the point guard position. The Jeremy Sohan experiment didn't last. And as it stands now, the Spurs have yet to identify a long term solution within their current roster at the point. All right, Jones and the Spurs are in Memphis tonight. The action gets underway at 7 o'clock. San Antonio hoping to start the new year off with its sixth win of the season against the 10 and 22 Grizzlies and John Morant is now back on the court. Hopefully the Spurs will be winning in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Yes. That walking winning. <laughs> See what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. Our KSAP Q&A is next.